The monster of sinful self-seeking, anatomized, by Edmund Calamy, 1600 to 1666. How necessary and neglected is this teaching in our increasingly narcissistic world today? Speaking on this topic, Pastor C.J. Mahoney said, quote, Left to ourselves, we would have continued to serve ourselves. A divine rescue was necessary to liberate us from the selfish ambition that motivated us. Close quote. Scripture indeed teaches that true greatness is defined not as sinful self-seeking, but as serving others for the glory of God. Christ denied his own preferment and advantage in order to serve us. Philippians chapter 2. An example he calls us to emulate. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. These words may be very fittingly called Paul's complaint a black bill of indictment drawn up against the times in which he lived. There are four things that make this complaint very remarkable. Number one, it is not made out of anger, faction, or any private discontent, but by a holy man of God, as he was guided by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is a true and most just complaint. Number two, it is not spoken of the heathens who did not know Christ, for it would be no wonder if those who did not know Christ did not to seek the things of Christ, nor of apostate Christians that had totally forsaken Christ. But, as Calvin and Estius observe, this complaint is made of brethren and fellow laborers. Christians that were not only baptized into the name of Christ, but also outwardly professing a great deal of love to Christ and his cause. And yet, even of these, it is said that they, quote, sought their own and not the things of Jesus Christ, close quote. Therefore, it is not only a true and just complaint, but a great, most sad and heavy charge. Number three, it is not drawn up by way of prediction what would happen in the last and worst times of the world, but by way of declaration what was actually being practiced in the apostles' days when the Church of Christ was a virgin church flourishing in all its beauty and glory while the blood of Christ was yet warm and the Christians were soldered together in love and unity by it. Yet, even in the apostles' days, the golden age of the church, quote, all men sought their own, and not the things of Jesus Christ, close quote. Had these words been a prophecy of our times, which are the last and worst times, the iron age of the church, in which it is crumbled, into a thousand factions, it would have been no wonder. But to make this charge upon the early apostolic times, that in the infancy of Christianity, all men sought their own interests and not the things of Christ, this makes the complaint not only very true and heinous, but also very striking and astonishing. Number four. The nature of the charge itself is higher than any other in all of Paul's epistles. And if I am not mistaken, I may truly call it the blackest bill of indictment that has ever been drawn up against the pure early apostolic age. And so, that we may better understand it, we must consider, letter A, the heinousness of the offense, and let her be the multitude of persons so offending. Roman numeral number one, the heinousness of the offense. 
letter A. The offense is both affirmative and negative. Number one, affirmative. Quote, all men seek their own, close quote. By this is meant their own honor and advancement. Not the honor of Christ, but their own honor. Their own private gain and advantage. Not the profit of religion, but their own profit. Their own delights, pleasures, and recreations. Their own ease, safety, and security. Not the safety of the gospel, but their own safety. Their own wills, lusts, and carnal contentments. Not to please Christ and do His will, but to do their own wills and to please themselves. To speak according to the language of our times, they sought their own private, carnal, and subordinate interests. Question. But why are these things called, quote, their own, close quote? Answer. Not because they are so properly, for there is nothing truly ours, but our sin. Our health, wealth, Riches and honors are not ours, but God's. Quote, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine. Close quote. Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. And quote, my wood and my flax. Close quote. Hosea chapter 2, verse 9. We are merely stewards of these things. Stewards who hold them only at the will and pleasure of the Lord. That which is properly called our own is that which we may keep as long as we please, and do with it what we please. But we cannot do so with our health, riches, and honors. For riches have wings and fly away from us whether we wish it or not. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 5. And so do honors and health. Therefore, these things cannot properly be said to be our own. Nor may we use them as we please, but only according to the way in which God has prescribed. Therefore, they are called, quote, another man's and not our own. Close quote, Luke chapter 16, verse 12. We ourselves are not our own. Even as Paul says, quote, You are not your own. Close quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Much less are these bodily comforts our own. But here they are called their own. Because men have a civil title to them. And because, in the opinion of the world... Uh, they are their own. This is the positive and affirmative part of the offense, and it is of a high nature, for it is a sin of the superlative degree for a Christian that believes in the immortality of his own soul to seek his own bodily promotion and interest while neglecting the profit and comfort of his eternal soul. And for a Christian that is elected and called to heavenly and everlasting things to seek only after earthly and temporary things. And this sin will appear even greater if we consider, number two, the negative branch of the offense, quote, and not the things of Jesus Christ, close quote. The things of Jesus Christ are the things of the church of Christ which are therefore called the things of Christ, letter A, because Christ is the husband of the church, and the things of the wife are the things of her husband, letter B, because Christ has purchased them for us by his suffering and death, letter C, because the great love that Christ has for his church, which is so great that the church's interest is his interest, and her injuries are his injuries. Acts chapter 9 verse 4. Letter D. Those who neglect the things of the church, neglect the things of Christ. Question. But what are the things of Jesus Christ? Answer. 
in general. They are none other than the preservation and propagation of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The building up of the church of Christ in verity, parity, and unity. But more particularly, the things of Christ are, letter A, the pure worship of Jesus Christ, the preaching of the word, and administration of the sacraments in Christ's way. Letter B, the precious truths of the gospel. Letter C, the government of the church according to scriptural pattern or the law of Moses. Letter D, the day of Christ. Letter E, the godly ambassadors of Christ. Letter F, the reformation of the church and corrupted in doctrine, worship, and discipline. Now then, the charge is that Christians in the early church, both ministers and others, sought their own interest and not the interests of Jesus Christ, that they built their own houses and not the house of God, and that they engrossed a kingdom unto themselves and did not propagate Christ's kingdom. Question. Did these primitive Christians not seek the things of Christ at all? Answer. The word quote, not, close quote, is not to be taken absolutely, but, as Calvin says, comparatively. We must not suppose that officers and members of the church threw away absolutely all care of Christ and his churches, but the meaning is that they did not seek the things of Christ warmly, sincerely, zealously, and primarily. They sought them in the least and last place. They pretended to seek the things of Christ, but sought their own things under color of seeking the things of Christ. And therefore, they are said not to have sought them at all. And the charge will be greater still if we consider, let her be, the multitude of persons offending. And the text says, quote, all Men, close quote. Question. Was there no man in the apostles' day that sought the good of the church of Christ? Answer. The word, quote, all, close quote, is not to be taken collectively here, but distributively. Not for everyone of all sorts, but for all sorts. Not for all properly, but for many. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 or for most men, as it is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16, quote, all men forsake me, close quote, that is, most men. Thus said Calvin, uh, well, I'm not even going to bother with the Latin here, um, the full meaning of the text is this, that even in the apostles' days, in a rio illo seculo, quo uh, virtutis omnes efflorent, in that quote, golden age, in which all virtues did flourish, close quote, there were very many in the church that outwardly professed a great deal of love to Christ and his church, yet, notwithstanding, sought their own ease, quiet, honor, and profit more than the preservation and propagation of the kingdom of Christ. Their own private gain and interest before and more than the interests of Jesus Christ. The words thus expounded are a perfect representation of the times in which we now live. And just as an editor, as a reader's note, remember this was in the 1600s or 17th century that he's saying this. Even back then. Anyway, I'll, I'll restart from there. The words thus expounded are a perfect representation of the times in which we now live. Methinks I can hardly see a man in place and power, but I can see it written upon his forehead in great characters. Quote, this man seeks himself and not the things of Jesus Christ. Close quote. If I had a window to look, into the hearts of all that are present here today, 
I'm afraid that I would find many self-seekers, but few Christ-seekers. Therefore, this text may appropriately be called England's Mirror, in which we may behold, number one, the great sin of England. I may say that her seeking of her own things, and not the things of Jesus Christ, is the sin that is the father and mother of all her other sins. It is the metropolis of all sin. Number two, the great and chief cause of all the miseries and calamities that have fallen upon this nation, the source and origin of all our unhappiness, is that all men seek themselves, and no man the things of Christ. Number three, the only way and remedy to be freed from all our miseries and affections, and that is by walking quite, quite contrary to the text, by seeking the things of Jesus Christ before, and more than, our own things, and by seeking them heartily, thoroughly, zealously, and sincerely. This is the only balm to cure England's sores, the only England-preserving mystery. I'm sorry, mercy. Point of doctrine. I have chosen this text for these three ends and purposes, and the doctrine I shall insist upon is this, that amongst the multitude of Christians who profess to love Christ and his church, there are many self-seekers, but very few Christ-seekers. It is an ancient, common, grievous, and hidden iniquity for a Christian who professes to love Christ to be a self-seeker and not a Christ-seeker. Letter A. It is an old and ancient sin as old as the primitive times, a sin of 1,600 years standing. Letter B. It is a general and land-overspreading sin, a sin that has seized upon men of all sorts, upon ministers, magistrates, masters, and parents. It is an epidemic disease. Letter C. It is a great and grievous sin, a soul, church, and state-destroying sin. Letter D. It is a secret and hidden sin, a sin that most are guilty of, and yet few will confess to be guilty of. There is no sin that has more fig leaves to hide it, excuses to extenuate it, or cloaks to cover it that I may better uncover and expose this great transgression, I shall briefly answer these four questions. Number one, are all those who are self-seeking diametrically opposed to seeking the interests of Christ? And number two, what kind of self-seeking is inconsistent with Christ-seeking? Number three, among such a multitude of Christians, why are there so many self-seekers and so few Christ-seekers? And number four, what makes this sin so grievous and mischievous? So question number one, are all those who are self-seeking diametrically opposed to seeking the interests of Christ? May a man be a Christ-seeker and yet a self-seeker? Answer. For an answer to this, you must know that it is not simply and absolutely unlawful for a man to seek himself, no more than it is to love himself. Religion does not destroy natural affections, rather it governs and sanctifies them. Gratia non extuagint set ordinat affectionis, says, says Aquinas. Non tolit set atolit naturum, that is, grace does not extinguish our natural affections, but regulates and elevates them. It does not dry up the stream of self-seeking, but turns it into the right channel. Religion does not pluck up the garden of nature, but rather weeds it. When a musician's instrument is out of tune, 
He will not break it, but tune it. So, religion does not abolish self-seeking, but only tunes and orders it. Therefore, you shall find in Scripture that there are many arguments drawn from self-love and self-seeking to persuade us to seek holiness and to dissuade us from sin. Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 46 through 47, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, Romans chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 13, Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. This scripture gives us leave to love and seek ourselves, if it is in a right manner. Moses did not sin in having an eye to the recompense of reward, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. Nor did the martyrs who could not accept deliverance, so that they might obtain a better resurrection, verse 35, who received joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing in themselves that in heaven they had a better and more enduring substance, that's chapter 10, verse 34. It is said even of Christ himself that, quote, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame, close quote. And that is chapter 12, verse 2. There is a great difference between amor merciaris and amor mercedis, or mercenary love and the love of reward. Mercenary love is when we serve God only for reward, and this is sinful. But to make the hope of reward one motive of service is not only lawful, but necessary. For it is our duty to use all God's motives, even as we use all of God's ordinances. And just as it is a sin for any man to say that he has no need of gospel ordinances, so also is it a sin to say that he has no need of gospel motives, and of them this is one of the foremost. Therefore, know that there is a threefold self-seeking. Number one, there is a lawful and an allowed self-seeking. Number two, there is not only a lawful, but a heavenly and blessed self-seeking. And number three, there is a sinful, cursed, and diabolical self-seeking. Number one, there is a lawful self-seeking, and that is when a Christian seeks his own private gain and honor in the last and least place, when he seeks the things of Christ in the first and foremost place, and his own things less, and after the things of Christ more, when he seeks his own things not in separation from, opposition to, or competition with the things of Christ but rather in subordination to them. In a word, when a Christian seeks his own things in due order and measure, so as not to hinder, but to further his seeking of the things of Christ, this is a lawful self-seeking. Number two, there is not only a lawful, but a most divine, angelic, heavenly, and blessed self-seeking. Here I shall hold forth a scriptural paradox. No man can be truly said to seek himself if he does not seek the things of Christ. The more we seek the things of Christ, the more we seek for ourselves. He that does not seek the things of Christ does not seek himself, but destroys himself. A Christ seeker and a true self seeker are terms that are used interchangeably. Question, what is this heavenly and blessed self-seeking? Answer, to understand this properly is a point of great concern. For the more we know of this divine self-seeking, the more we will shun and abhor sinful self-seeking. Give me leave to deliver what I have to say about it in the following propositions, which I do not name as several distinct heads, but as diverse instances of divine and sublimated self-seeking. Proposition number one. The man who seeks the good of his soul more than the good of his body seeks himself in a divine manner. 
The body of man is the worst half of man. It is the lowliest part of man, the shell, the box, the carcass of a man. A man is what he is inwardly. The soul of a man is the man himself. Therefore, the man that seeks to beautify his soul with grace to be made Christ's picture and a real member of his body, this man, and this man only, seeks himself. He that seeks the good of his body to the hurt of his soul does not seek himself, but rather he seeks the destruction of both his body and soul. The man that makes a fire that burns himself and his house does not seek the good of himself or his house. The merchant that overloads his ship in such a way as to drown both it and himself does not seek his own good, and so also. The man that overpampers his body, that labors to take care of his skin rather than his soul, to stuff his body with dainty food, to clothe his body with fine apparel, and in the meantime to neglect his most precious soul, this man does not seek himself, but rather he ruins himself. For the happiness of the body depends upon the happiness of the soul. If the soul goes to hell at death, the body also will go there at the great resurrection. Therefore, he that beats down his body and brings it into subjection, which is called mortification, that labors to make it an appropriate servant to his soul, that endures hardship with his body, even as a, quote, good soldier of Jesus Christ, close quote, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, that wears and tires out his body in the service of God, that works with his body for the good of his soul, this is the true, heavenly, and blessed self-seeker. Proposition number two. The man who seeks his eternal welfare more than his temporal prosperity who seeks not only to make himself happy for 40 or 50 years, but forever and ever, this man seeks himself in a divine manner. For what will it profit a man to be happy for a few years in this life, yet to be miserable forever in hell hereafter? How quickly will a man in hell forget the happiness he has had here? He that makes provision to live pleasurably and comfortably on earth but makes no provision to live happily when he dies. This man may seem to love himself in the present moment, but surely hates himself from an eternal perspective. He that lays up treasure for himself on earth, but none in heaven, may be accounted rich in this world, which will quickly end, but he will be poor in the world without end. Such a self-hater was Devas, Luke chapter 16. And so also the rich fool, Luke chapter 12. And those also who lay up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God, Luke chapter 12, verse 21. He who labors to live a holy life here, so that he may live happily hereafter, is to live graciously here, so that he may inherit eternal glory hereafter. And this man is a divine self-seeker. Proposition number three. He that denies his sinful self most, seeks himself most. He that hates himself to the extent that he has been corrupted by Adam's fall, and seeks the utter ruin and extirpation of the old Adam within him, this man truly loves himself, and this is divine self-seeking. To kill your sins, that your sins may not kill your soul. As Zifra, by circumcising her child, saved the life of her husband, so the way to save your soul is to circumcise and pair off, quote, all superfluity of naughtiness, close quote. 
James chapter 1, verse 21. This is the meaning of that which Christ said, quote, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For if it, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Close quote. Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 through 30. The more you hate your profitable and pleasurable sins, the more you love yourself. It is the same as for a man who has dropsy. The more he denies himself drink, the more he seeks himself because the less he drinks, the more he destroys his disease. Even so, the more you deny your corrupt self, the more you seek yourself, because the more you deny your corrupt self, the more you destroy your principal spiritual disease, ruin the devil's faction within you, and weaken the opposition of the flesh against the spirit. He that loves his sins hates his own soul, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 36, Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. He that serves sin shall reap hell. He that makes provision for the flesh provides the fuel for hell fire. He that nourishes the old Adam within him cherishes that which taints and pollutes all his holy duties, disinclining him to all good and disposing him to all evil. He cherishes his soul's greatest enemy, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He delights in that which was Paul's greatest misery, and which made him cry out, quote, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Close quote. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, I may truly say that he who is the greatest self-denier is the greatest self-seeker. Proposition number four. He that seeks to do the most service to God in his generation, that seeks his own glory by seeking God's glory, this man is a divine self-seeker. This is because the perfection of everything consists in attaining the end for which it was made. The perfection of meat is to be eaten. He that hoards it and will not eat it destroys it. The end for which God made man is to serve him, to glorify him here, and to enjoy him hereafter. Or, Westminster Catechism, question number one. Therefore, the more service we do to God, and the more we seek His glory, the more we attain the purpose of our creation, and therein we are most happy. He that loves himself for himself, and for his own ends, destroys himself. Because the end for which God made us is to serve Him, and not ourselves. When all the streams of self-love flow into the great ocean of love for God, this is divine self-love. For Westminster question number one, again. All oh, that men would labor to love themselves and seek themselves in this manner, to look upon themselves as servants and instruments unto God and His glory, and say, quote, Lord, how may I advance myself by advancing your name? How may I glorify myself by glorifying you? How may I seek myself by seeking your praise and perfect myself by inclining myself and my understanding, memory, will, heart, affections, and actions to you and to your glory? Close quote. Proposition number five. The more a man serves God out of pure love, without reflection to self, the more he seeks himself. This is a certain truth. 
the less we seek ourselves and our own ends in any holy duty, the more we seek ourselves. Because the less we seek ourselves, the more we seek God and His glory. And the more we seek God and His glory, the more reward we shall have. The less we look after reward for that which we do, the more reward we shall have. Therefore, the papists who teach men to do good works, that by them they might merit heaven, supposing their doctrine to be true, they lose all the reward of their good works. He that serves God only to merit by his service cannot merit by his service. The more he eyes the merit, the less he merits. He that serves God for his own ends does not serve God, but rather serves himself. He that serves God for God's sake shall be rewarded by God. The less we eye ourselves in any duty, the more reward we shall have, and therefore the more we seek ourselves. Proposition number six. The man who seeks the glory and honor of God above his own is a divine self-seeker. And this is because the happiness of man is more in God than in himself. As the happiness of a member of the body is in conjunction with the body, so the happiness of man is in conjunction with God, who is our principle and universal good. Therefore, he that seeks union with God most, seeks himself most. As the safety of the beam is more in the sun than it is in itself, and of the streams in the fountain than in itself, so the safety, comfort, and happiness of every Christian is more in God than in himself. Thus, he that seeks the glory and honor of God more than his own glory and honor is a heavenly and blessed self-seeker. Proposition number seven. He that loves the public good more than his own private good, that seeks the prosperity of Zion and Jerusalem, of church and state more than his own. This man is a divine self-seeker. Oh, that this word were mingled with faith. Out of self-love, a man that is in danger of having his head cut off will willingly lift up his arm and permit it to be cut off if it will only save his head. He does this because his life is more in his head than in his arm. Our safety is more wrapped up in the public welfare than our own private interests. And therefore, those who prefer the public good before their private interests are the truest self-seekers. Thus did old Eli, he mourned more for the loss of the ark than for the death of his two sons. Or Samuel chapter 4. David also did this. He preferred Jerusalem over his chief joy. Psalm 137 verse 6. In a storm at sea, he that does the most to seek the preservation of the ship is the one who also seeks the preservation of his own trunk. For if the ship is sunk, his trunk cannot be saved. The truth is, if the church and true religion are destroyed, to what purpose is it for a godly man to live? I read of Titus Vespasian, that when the soldiers had destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, they came to him and asked him what they should do with the priests that had survived. Quote, kill them, he said. For now, their work is at an end. Close quote. When religion has been destroyed, what advantage will it be for a godly man to live? Therefore, those that seek the good of the church more than their own interests 
are blessed self-seekers. Proposition number eight. The man who would rather lose his wife, children, estate, and even his own life, instead of sinning against God, this man is a divine self-seeker. This is because his happiness consists more in keeping a good conscience than in keeping his estate or saving his life. The holy martyrs who, quote, loved not their lives unto death, close quote, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, were the greatest self-seekers. It is a most blessed self-seeking to suffer the fire of martyrdom and avoid the fire of hell, to lose earthly promotions, but attain everlasting honors. Therefore, Christ argues from self-love when he says, quote, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it, close quote. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, C.F. also, Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. The ancient martyrs did this, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, and chapter 11, verse 35. He that loses all for Christ shall find more than he has lost in Christ. From all that I've said concerning this blessed self-seeking, I gather these three conclusions. Number one, no man is a true self-seeker who is not a true Christ-seeker. Number two, true religion and a conscious walking according to the rules of it is founded upon right reason. Furthermore, no man can be said to be a truly rational man if he is not a religious man. For the more religious any man is, the more he seeks himself and his own happiness. And on the contrary, the more irreligious he is, the more he ruins and destroys himself. Number three, whosoever would love himself and seek himself rightly must labor to seek the things of Jesus Christ. Oh, that I could persuade you to this blessed self-seeking, to seek your own gain and honor in seeking the honor of God and the good of both church and state. Number three, but now, in the third place, besides this lawful, heavenly, and blessed self-seeking, there is a sinful, cursed, and devilish self-seeking. Self-seeking, which the text complains of, which is inconsistent and incompatible with a true Christ-seeking, which is the root of all the miseries that have befallen this nation. It is the great destroyer of church, state, and soul. This leads me to the second question. Question number two. What kind of self-seeking is inconsistent with Christ-seeking? Answer. It is a spiritual monster with six heads. Number one. When a Christian seeks his own things apart from the things of Christ. When he seeks his own ease, safety, and interest and does not care at all what becomes of Jesus Christ and his cause, when he sets up himself and makes himself the principal rule and end of all his undertakings, acting for himself as a principal, by himself as a rule, and unto himself as an end, when a man makes himself his God, worships himself, and does whatever he does for his carnal self, be it serving himself in committees, the army, parliament, or ministry, and not caring what becomes of religion and reformation. This is the first head of this monster. Such a self-seeker was Gallio, the deputy, who did not care what became of religion 
Acts chapter 18, verse 17. If it had been a matter of wrongdoing, he would have heard their complaint. But because it was a matter of religion, he refused to hear it. Such self-seekers were the people of Meroz. And therefore, the Israelites were commanded to curse them. Judges chapter 5, verse 23. Number two. When a Christian seeks his own things, and also the things of Christ, but seeks his own things before the things of Christ. When he seeks his own things first, and afterwards the things of Christ. Of this, the prophet Haggai complains. For the people said it was not time to build God's house, but rather it was time to build their own houses. Haggai chapter 1 verses 2 through 11. Therefore, the heavens over them were as brass, and the earth withheld her fruit. Number three. When a man seeks his own things, and also the things of Christ, but seeks his own things chiefly and principally, not only before, but more than the things of Christ, and that both in his value and esteem, and in his love and affection. When a man prizes his own profit and preferment, and loves his own praise and glory more than the prophet, praise and honor of Christ and his gospel. Such were the Gadarenes, or the Gadarenes, who preferred their hogs before Christ. Such were the merchants and farmers who made light of the call of Christ, preferring their farms and merchandising before Christ and his gospel. Matthew chapter 22, verse 5. Such was Demas, who forsook Paul to embrace this present world. And such were the Pharisees, who loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John chapter 12, verse 43. Number four. When a Christian seeks his own things in seeking the things of Christ, when he pretends to seek the things of Christ, yet intends no such thing, but seeks himself, even under the color of seeking the things of Christ. Such a one was Jehu, who pretended to have a great zeal for the Lord of hosts. Quote, Come, he said to Jonadab, and behold my zeal. Close quote. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 16. But he merely pretended to have zeal for God. In reality, his zeal was to purchase the kingdom for himself. Such a one was Balaam, who pretended that if he had a house full of gold and silver given to him, he would not go beyond the commandment of God. Numbers chapter 22, verse 18. And yet, his love for God was but a counterfeit, for he loved the wages of iniquity and sought after the performance that Balak offered him, or Balak offered him. Such another was Demetrius the silversmith, who pretended a zeal to the great goddess Diana, and therefore caused an uproar against Paul to defend the goddess. Acts chapter 19, verses 23 through 29. But it was the gain that he got by making shrines for Diana that was the principle that sent him to his work. His pretended love for Diana, but intended to promote his own interest. He had dolom in idolo, that is, treachery in the idol, as one said. Number five. When a man seeks his own things, when they stand in competition with and opposition to the things of Christ... When things come to so narrow a bridge that he must, in a good conscience, either part with the state, liberty, or life, or with Christ, if he chooses to part with Christ instead of with his liberty, estate, or life, this man is a wicked self-seeker. Such a one was the young man in the gospel who forsook Christ rather than parting with his great possessions. 
Matthew chapter 19, verse 22. Such was Spira, who tells the story himself. He placed wife, children, liberty, estate, and life in one part of the balance, and God, Christ, the gospel, and a good conscience in the other and forsook the last to preserve the first. Number six. The last head of this monster is when a Christian seeks the good of his body to the prejudice of his soul. When he bestows all of his time, strength, and cares, and endeavors, and providing for his perishing carcass, yet neglects to provide for his eternal soul, when he lays up all his treasure upon earth, but has no treasure laid up in heaven, when he is anxiously solicitous for a comfortable living in this world, but strangely neglectful to take care for his happy living in the other world, this is a sinful, cursed, and devilish self-seeking. And so much in answer to the second question. Question number three. How is it possible that there should be so many men who profess themselves to be Christians, professing love to Christ and his interest, at least in words, and yet, notwithstanding, still seek their own interest before and more than the interest of Christ. Answer. This soul-destroying and church-destroying self-seeking proceeds from six sinful and cursed roots. Number one, from lack of true and unfeigned love to Jesus Christ and his interests. Love is a most powerful affection, the matter wheel that carries the whole soul after it. Pondus miam amor mios, said Augustine, io ferror Quo compi furor, my weight is my love, by it I am carried wherever I am carried. As the primu mobile in the heavens carried all the other spheres about with it, so love carries the whole man with it. Quote, love is as strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the flood drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be condemned, close quote. Canticles, or Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 to 7. If we love the Lord Jesus and his gospel in good earnest, we would rather part with liberty, estate, life, and all our own things than to lose the things of Christ, even as the blessed martyrs did. But because there are few men that love Jesus Christ in sincerity, hence it is that most men seek their own things and not the things of Christ. Number two, it proceeds from that cursed self-love which is in all men by nature. Scripture teaches that self-love is the first cause and root of all other sins. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Self-love is like a great tree, and these 18 sins are as 18 branches which all sprout from this one root. Because men are lovers of themselves, therefore they are also covetous, proud, unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God, and so forth. Sinful self-seeking proceeds from this sinful self-love. As the love of Christ is the root of Christ-seeking, so the love of ourselves is the root of sinful self-seeking. Number three, from that immoderate and inordinate worldly love which is in all men by nature. For as a martyr, well set at the stake, if we should unrip and anatomize a wicked man, we would find nothing in him 
but self-love and worldly love. By nature, we love the creature more than the creator, pleasures more than God, and the praise of men more than the praise of God. By nature, we love our own gain, safety, and ease more than the things of Christ. And therefore, it is that we seek our own things and not the things of Christ. Number four, from the hypocrisy, insincerity, and rottenness of heart, which is in all men by nature. Hence it is because of the hypocrisy and falseness of their hearts that men pretend Jesus Christ, but intend their own private interest. Thus the Pharisees, who were hypocrites, made long prayers under pretense that they might devour widows' houses. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Thus, Herod pretends to worship Christ when his intention was to attack him. Matthew chapter 2, verse 8. Thus, Jezebel proclaimed a fast and pretended religion, but really only intended to put Naboth to death in order to get his vineyard. 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 5 through 16. Thus, Absalom covers over his rebellion with the fair cloak of religion. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 7. There are two things that are in all men by nature. Letter A, to make a show of religion. And letter B, to cover over all manner of wickedness under the show of religion. Ungodliness is so odious that if it should appear in its own colors, all men would abhor it. And therefore, even as the devil never shows himself, but under some handsome form, sometimes under Samuel's mantle, sometimes transformed into an angel of light, so also do sin and iniquity always appear under the form of godliness. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through the apostle tells us that in the last times there will be men who are lovers of themselves, treacherous, heady, high-minded, without natural affection, and so forth, having, quote, a form of godliness, close quote. These last words are understood, and then there's a Greek word, understood as relating to all the former sins. They are covenant breakers, having a form of godliness. They are covetous, false accusers, blasphemous self-lovers. Yet, they have a form of of godliness. Through the hypocrisy that is in them, they cover all their sins under the disguise of a form of godliness. Number five. This sinful self-seeking arises from a spiritual ignorance and blindness which is in all men by nature. There is no wicked man who rightly understands what it is to seek himself, for he thinks that if he seeks to satisfy his corrupt self, he seeks himself, that if he seeks the good of his body to the neglect of his soul, he seeks himself. He thinks that if he seeks his own ease, gain, safety, and preferment without looking after the things of Christ that he seeks himself. The rich fool who built larger barns for himself did this, saying, quote, Soul, take thy ease, close quote. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. He supposed that he sought his own happiness in so doing. So did the rich glutton when he, quote, clothed himself in purple and fared deliciously every day, close quote. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. 
But if the wicked man understood that this sinful self-seeking is really self-hating and self-destroying, that the rich glutton damns his soul by pampering his body, and the rich fool loses his soul for all eternity by laying up goods for a few years, then he would also understand that the man that denies himself most seeks himself most. He that serves God best seeks himself most. He that seeks the glory of God before his own glory, the good of church and state more than his own good, seeks himself most. He that loses his life for Christ shall find a better life in Christ. If the wicked man truly believed this, he would not sinfully seek himself. And therefore, this sinful self-seeking proceeds from a spiritual ignorance and blindness that is in us all by nature. Number six. Lastly, it springs from that spiritual self-deceit and soul delusion that is in all men by nature. Every man by nature is like Narcissus, in love with himself, blind to his own cause, and apt to think that he seeks the things of Christ when he does not, and that he does not seek his own things in opposition to, competition with, or comparison of the things of Christ. Even as the philosopher who could not be persuaded but that snow was black, or the mad Athenian who thought that all the ships that came to Athens were his. So also, there are multitudes of Christians who fancy that they seek the things of Christ when it is apparent to others that they do not, and by this self-deceit trick themselves into hell. Thus you see the accursed roots from whence this sinful self-seeking proceeds. Question number four. The fourth and last question is, what makes this sin so grievous and mischievous? Answer. It is a sin of the first magnitude. Though it is an inward and invisible sin, and therefore not so infamous and scandalous to the eyes of man as some other sins are, yet it is very odious and abominable to the sight of God. Though it is minoris infame, or less disgraceful, yet it is majoris culpa, greater guilt. Four, number one, it is a sin against the express words of Scripture. The apostle says, quote, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Close quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. In other words, don't seek your own prosperity, seek the prosperity of your neighbor. The sinful self-seeker lies on the opposite side of this text. He seeks his own and not another's wealth. Number two. It is a sin against the light of nature. Nature itself teaches us that no man is born for himself, but rather for the good of the commonwealth in which he lives. <laughs> Even the heathens despise his self-seeker. Number three, it is a sin against the pattern that Christ has left us. For he came into the world not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. Quote, he pleased not himself. Close quote. Romans chapter 15, verse 3. He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself and became obedient, even to the death of the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. He knew no sin denied himself so far as to be made sin for us. Actually, let me read that again. He who knew no sin denied himself so far as to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 
Now it is a certain truth that he who does not follow the example of Christ's life shall never have any benefit by the merit of his death. Christ is only meritum beneficial to those for whom he is exemplum, that is, pattern. Number four, it is a sin against the royal law of charity. Charity is a most noble grace, the very queen of all graces. It is as necessary as it is excellent. For though we give all we have to feed the poor, though we have given our bodies to be burned, yet if we have not charity, quote, it profited us nothing, close quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. But a sinful self-seeker is entirely made up of uncharitableness. Letter A. He has no love for Jesus Christ and his interests. And there is a double curse pronounced against those that love not the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. Letter B. He has no love for his neighbor, but merely for his own ends. He has a more... I'm not even going to bother with the Latin. He has erotic love or merely friendship, which is not love, but rather merchandise. Letter C. He has no love for church or state. All his love centers upon himself. He is holy, that's W-H-O-L-L-Y. He is completely compounded of self-love and creature love, which is a composition God hates. Number five, and I'll try to calm down reading this. It's just so awesome to read it. <laughs> Number five, it is a sin that makes all our holy duties abominable in the sight of God. Though the deeds we do may be ever so holy, yet if we do them with political designs, if we aim at ourselves and what we do, the Lord abhors us and all we do. And this we see in the Pharisees, who gave alms, prayed, and fasted in order to be seen by men. And therefore, God abhorred all they did. The self aims pollute and putrefy all holy deeds. Number six. It is a sin of horrible hypocrisy, for it is making use of religion as a ladder to climb up to preferment and then casting the ladder away. It is setting up God as a panderer to our ambitions and covetous interests, which is hypocrisy, and to be abhorred. It is using God to gratify ourselves, which is no small transgression. Number seven, it is idolatry in the highest degree. It is self-worship making ourselves and our own interests as the root, rule, and scope of all our undertakings. And this makes us into an idol for ourselves to worship, and usurps the throne of God. It is idolatry against the first commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 which is greater than the idolatry against the second, and also verses 4 through 6, insofar as the heart is better than the knee. Number eight, it is a sin that is the fruit of six cursed roots, as you have already heard, and the root of many cursed fruits. It is the chief of all the vices, a sin that is in itself the cause of all sin, the plague sore of the church and of the state, the great church devouring and state destroying sin. To give a few instances, letter A. What is the reason that the government of the church, so happily begun, is now obstructed and almost quite broken into pieces? Is it not because that all men seek their own, and no men the things of Christ? Letter B. What is the reason that the house of God lies in waste 
while every man labors to build his own house. Let her see. Why is it that men complain of taxes and lack of trading, but no man complains that the house of God is neglected, the pure ordinance is despised, and the godly ministry undervalued? Is it not because all men seek their own, and not the things of Jesus Christ? Letter D. What is the reason that the truths of Christ are trampled underfoot? Men are permitted to deny the divinity of Christ and the scriptures. And no one says, why do you do so? But let a man speak a word against the laws of men, and he shall be severely punished. Is this not because all men seek their own, and not the things of Jesus Christ? Letter E. What is the reason that so few gentlemen, citizens, and ministers appear for the things of Christ? That so many silence themselves and allow religion to be almost lost, and yet dare not appear for it? Why is it that our lectures are so little frequented in so many places? How many are actually going to listen to this sermon? <laughs> How many think nothing is too much to give to their position, but anything is too much for their ministry? That a master will be very exact in seeing that his servant does his business on the weekdays, but indulges him to do what he pleases on the Lord's day. Is this not because all men seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ? Letter F. What is the reason that the things of the church drive on so slowly, like Egyptian chariots whose wheels have been taken off? What is the reason that there is so much oppression and injustice in places of judicature? So much deceit and false dealing in our commerce with one another. In summary, what is the cause of all our miseries in both church and state? Is it not because all men seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ? Thus you have the greatness and the mischievousness of this sinful self seeking. So much for the explanation of the doctrine. I come now to the application, the use of application. If this is so, that amongst the multitude of Christians that profess love to Christ and his cause, that there are many that seek their own and not the things of Christ, then let us, I beseech you, behold, as in a mirror, the sinfulness and misery of the times in which we live. For if the apostle complains of his times, which were the first and the best times, the golden age, the primitive apostolic virgin church, when the saints of God met together in one place and in one accord, much more, may we say, of our times, which are the last and worst, that they are in the Iron Age, in which the Church of Christ is woefully divided and astonishingly apostatized. How justly may we take up this same complaint against our times, that, quote, all men seek their own and not the things of Jesus Christ, close quote. And yet, I dare not say this applies to all men collectively. I believe there are a few names, even in England, which have not defiled their garments and have not bowed their knees to Baal. There are some magistrates, gentlemen, ministers, and citizens still remaining that seek the things of Jesus Christ more than their own, yea, even to the neglect and loss of their own, that seek the prosperity and welfare of Zion more than their own. There are some Ezra's, Nehemiah's, and Daniel's that lay to heart 
the desolations of the church and with old Eli are more troubled about the ark of God than their own private relations. But these are very few in comparison. It is certain that most are guilty of this sinful self-seeking. Most magistrates, gentlemen, ministers, and citizens. Now then, let us examine ourselves to see if we are among the number of this multitude. To quicken you to this, consider, number one, that it is, or that this sin is both a new and an Old Testament sin. It reigned not only in Paul's time, but in Deborah's and Barak's, who tell us that for the divisions of Reuben, there were very great searchings of heart, because he lived among the sheep and did not care what became of the church of God. That's Judges chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. Number two, it is a common and ordinary sin, and few are free from it. Number three, it is a great and crying abomination, as you have heard. Number four, it is a great and hidden iniquity, an inward, invisible, and spiritual sin that consumes England, and now the United States, not as a lion, but as a moth. It is threatened that God would be to Ephraim as a moth and as a lion. Hosea chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Murder, adultery, sodomy, and injustice devour England, as well as the United States, as a lion. But self-love and self-seeking destroy it as a moth, secretly and yet certainly. Let us therefore be very serious in the work of trying ourselves. There are three sorts of men whom I indict as guilty of this sinful and cursed self-seeking. Number one, those who seek their own things and not the things of Christ at all. Number two, those who seek their own things before and more than the things of Christ. And number three, those who pretend to seek the things of Christ, but seek their own things under the color of seeking the things of Christ. Number one, those that seek their own credit, profit, advantage, ease, and safety, and not the things of Christ at all. It is reported of Agrippina, the mother of Nero, that when she was told that if her son ever became the emperor, he would surely put her to death, she answered, let me perish so that he may rule. In our day, there are many who say in their hearts, it does not matter to me what becomes of religion and reformation, so long as I may get an estate and grow great in the world. Question. Are there any Christians of this mind? Answer. There are many who are called Christians who are of this mind. They have the name, and only the name, of Christians, carrying this name, as Uriah did his letters to Joab, not for salvation, but for damnation. You shall know them by this character. If such men as these have success in their trade, enjoy outward prosperity, and are freed from taxes, 501c3, they will think themselves sufficiently happy. It is all the same to them if all religions are tolerated, or none at all. First Amendment to the Constitution. These men say with Tiberius the Emperor, the gods' concerns are their own. Let God take care of religion. All our care is for our outward estate. Those who mind earthly things in this way make money their God. Their end is damnation. Of them, I may say, as Christ said of Judas, quote, Better had they never been born. Close quote. Mark chapter 14, verse 21. Number two. Those who seek their own things before and more than the things of Christ. They seek their own interest more cordially, industriously, and vigorously than the interest of religion. 
The Gadaren did this, as you have already heard, as do most Christians. Question. How shall I know whether I prefer, in my judgment, affections or conversation, my own outward interest before the interest of Christ in the gospel? Answer number one. If the seeking of your own things takes up the first, best, and most of your time, if the marrow and strength of your soul goes out after them, if you make them your employment, your seek ye first, and one thing necessary, but the things of Christ are your pastime or an idle hour. If the seeking of your own things make you neglect the things of Christ or seek after them negligently, this is a sign that you overvalue and cherish your own things and undervalue and disdain the things of Christ. Answer number two. If you mourn more for personal miseries than for the desolation of Zion, it is a sign that you value your own things more than the things of Christ. And this is a frame of spirit quite opposite to true saintship. For Ezra, Nehemiah, David, Daniel, and Jeremiah were more afflicted with the miseries of the church than with their own. Answer number three. If the seeking of your own things take away your courage for Christ and his cause and make you come to Christ by night, as Nicodemus did. And the more you have of the world, the less you appear for Christ and his gospel. The more honors you have, the more fearful you become. If the preserving of your own things makes you betray the things of Christ by sinful silence or bare cowardice, this is a sign that you prefer your own interests before the interest of Christ. Answer number four. If the seeking of your own things makes you seek out excuses and vain pretenses to hinder you from appearing for Christ, this is a sign that you prefer your own interests before the interest of Christ. I read in Luke chapter 14, verse 18, when the servant was sent to fetch the guests to the great supper of the gospel, they, quote, all with one consent, began to make excuse, close quote. The times in which we live are very sinful and perilous. The truths and ministry of Christ are trampled underfoot. Religion and reformation are neglected. Now, God, by us, his ambassadors, calls upon you to appear for his truths and for his gospel ministry and gospel ordinances. Methinks I hear the nobleman say, quote, I have a great estate to lose. Pray have me excused. Close quote. I hear the rich citizens say, quote, I shall be utterly undone in my trading. Pray have me excused. Close quote. I hear the voluptuous Epicure say, quote, I have married a wife. Pray have me excused. Close quote. Take it for a certain rule. If the seeking of these outward things causes you to make excuses, you seek them sinfully. For if you look into the text, which I have previously mentioned, you will find that the excuses they are made were. Letter A lying and false. They say they cannot come, whereas the truth was, they would not come. Non posse pretenditur, nole in cause est. It is not pretended to be able to, but the cause is to refuse to. Another excuse they made, letter B, was poor and frivolous. What is a farm in comparison with heaven? or marrying a wife in comparison with being married to Jesus Christ. Letter C. Vain and unprofitable. Unprofitable. Notwithstanding the excuses they have made, it is said that, quote, none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper, close quote. That's verse 24. Letter D. Unreasonable and unconscious 
unconscionable. For they made those things snares of the devil, pitfalls and impediments to hinder them from Christ, instead of the bonds of obedience, that is, motives and encouragements to bring them to Christ. Answer number five. Lastly, when your own things and the things of Christ come into competition, and you must part with one or the other, if you choose as Spirit did, and as the young man in the gospel did, the one Christ loved, parting with Christ and his gospel rather than with your own profit and preferment, this is a sure sign that you seek your own things before the things of Christ. I have read that Tiberius Caesar asked the Senate to add Christ into the number of their gods, but they refused to do it, because if they received him, they must reject all their other gods. Therefore, they chose to renounce Jesus Christ rather than to receive him and part with the rest of their feigned deities. If you renounce and reject the Lord Jesus Christ and his truths rather than losing your creature comforts and enjoyments, you are a sinful self-seeker of the highest form. But now, on the contrary, if you pursue the things of Christ first and foremost, if you mourn more for the church's desolations than for your own personal miseries, if the more wealth you have, the more courageous you are for God, and you are glad that you have an estate to lose for Christ's cause, if the seeking of your own things does not put upon you or put you upon lying, vain, frivolous, and unconscionable excuses, if you are like Hormus, uh, Hormicidus, a nobleman of Persia who was deposed from all his honors because he would not deny his religion, and was afterwards restored again, only to be asked again to deny Christ and his truths, whereupon he rent his purple robe and laid all his honors at the foot of the emperor and said, You intend for me to deny Christ in order to reobtain my honors? Then take them all back again. If this is the frame of your heart, it is a sure sign that you prize, love, and seek the things of Christ before and more than your own things. Number three. The third kind of sinful self-seekers are those who pretend to seek the things of Christ, but seek their own things under the guise of seeking the things of Christ. Think Joel Osteen, Cole, uh, Copeland, the rest of them, in our day. They hold forth the preservation and propagation of religion as a stalking horse by which they catch men. To them it is merely a blind used to deceive the world. They may aim at religion, but what they truly seek is their own gain, like Jehu, who sought to obtain a kingdom, or Balaam, who sought the wages of iniquity. The sin of self-seeking is so odious to both God and man that it never appears upon the stage in its own likeness, but always covered over with Samuel's mantle. There is no sin which has more fig leaves and religious cloaks to cover it than this sin. By this means, the Pope of Rome has purchased his triple crown. For it is said that the Antichrist would have two horns, like a lamb, but would act as a dragon. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. This signifies to us that the Antichrist will act all his felonies and bloody massacres under the guise of religion, and by this means deceive all the world. Therefore, anti-Christianism is a, quote, mystery of iniquity, close quote. That is, iniquity covered over with fair shows and pretenses of godliness. The ministers like that are innumerable on every denomination that professes the name of Christ. What murders and treasons has the Pope committed under the color of defending the Catholic religion, under the pretense of being Peter's successor 
and having Peter's keys and chair. Witness the Holy League, as it was called in France. Witness the gunpowder plot or treason amongst us, undertaken under a show of religion for the defense of the Catholic cause. What I affirm of Papists and Jesuits, the same I say of all the errors and heresies that have been broached in the Christian world. The Apostle tells us that the first authors of heresies and schisms were great self-seekers, men greedy for filthy loose, who did not serve the Lord Jesus, but their own bellies, who made merchandise of the souls of people, making gain their godliness, not godliness their gain. But though they were such, yet they did not appear to be such, but appeared to be very holy and self-denying. Therefore Christ calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Ravening wolves inwardly, though innocent sheep outwardly. They honed over the poison of their doctrine with good words and fair speeches in order to deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans chapter 16, verse 18. Such a one was Pelagius, one of the greatest enemies to the doctrine of grace that ever the church has had. He made such a show of godliness that when Jerome first wrote against his heresies, he was forced to conceal his name, lest by appearing to write against him, his books would have been rejected by the people who did so highly magnify him. Let me add that this is a sin which not only papists, Jesuits, schismatics, and heretics are tainted with, but most Christians in the world as well. It is a most true saying. There are few, and but a very few, who love Christ for Christ's sake. Close quote. Most people follow Christ for the loaves, John chapter 6, verse 26, and make use of Christ to serve their own ends and interests. If a man is about to marry a wife, he will in words pretend that it is religion and godliness that he desires most of all. But if you had a window to look into his heart, you would find that it is money which is his chief aim. But among all sorts of men, statesmen, and politicians are most eminently guilty of this sin, for they usually bring religion upon the stage merely to usher in their political designs. I would say both Democrat and Republican Party in the year 2019. It is a cursed maxim in Machiavelli that, quote, kings and princes should labor after a show of religion, but not look much after the substance, close quote. For the substance would be a burden, but the appearance of it would be very useful for the carrying on of their own ends and designs. This wicked advice and counsel is followed by many kingdoms and commonwealths to this day. There has scarcely ever been any reformer of state or church who reformed religion for religion's sake, but instead did it for his own ends, to get revenge upon his enemies, to gain church revenues, to be a coy duck, or to draw some party to side with him. Let me give a few examples. It pleased God to order affairs in Henry VIII's time that the Pope's supremacy was abolished in England. But what was the principle that moved the king to do this? Was it out of love for the true religion? Or was it not rather that by it he might get revenge on the Pope, who would not allow him to divorce his first wife? I have read of Maximilian, Emperor of Germany, who, living in Luther's time, 
professed great zeal for the Reformation, especially for plucking down golden images. But the story says that it, it was not so much out of hatred of the images as out of love to the gold, which made him undertake it. In the history of the civil wars in France, I read that when the princes of the blood fell out with one another, one party called in the Protestants to their assistance, not out of a love to religion, but that by it they might gain a party. Sounds like the Tea Party. Or the Trump administration. That which I say of kingdoms and commonwealths, the same I say of armies. I read of Goliath's sword hidden in a cloth behind the ephod. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. This sword never appears to the world under bloody colors, but always clothed with a linen ephod, pretending reformation of abuses in church and state. But it is worth remembering that this sword was the sword of Goliath, who defied the Israel of God and was a great enemy to religion. The sum of all this amounts to this, that in all ages of the church, especially in times of civil war and times of reformation, there are thousands that hold forth to the world in their words and declarations a sincere desire to propagate the gospel in the kingdom of Christ and to advance the pure ordinances of Christ. Yet, notwithstanding, mind nothing really and inwardly but their preferment and advancement. Question. But how shall I know whether I am merely a pretender to the things of Jesus Christ? Whether I am one who makes use of religion to serve my own interests? Whether I am like Demetrius the silversmith who minded his gain more than his goddess? Answer. If we would deal faithfully with our own souls, we could not help but easily know this. And to help you in it, take these rules. Number one, if you are equally zealous for the advancement of religion and reformation when it does not concern your own interest as when it does, this is a certain sign that you seek the things of Christ in sincerity. And thus it was with Moses in the rebellion of Korah and his company. Numbers chapter 16. There was a conjunction of interests. The conspiracy was against God and Moses. But the idolatry of the golden calf was only against the interest of God. Exodus chapter 32. Moses was not prejudiced by it. And yet he was just as zealous for the glory of God in the latter as in the former. But now on the contrary, if you drive seriously, when any gain is to be gotten by reformation, but very heavily and slowly when your interest is not at all concerned, and this is a sign that you make use of religion for your own ends. And thus it was with Jehu. He had a double idolatry to root out, the idolatry of Baal, and the idolatry of Jeroboam's calves. He destroyed the first, but continued the second, because it was against his interest to abolish it. 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 28 through 29. Kind of like Trump and the homosexuals. Thus it is with many masters of families. If their servants play the thieves, they will cry out against them as dishonorers of God. But let the same servants profane the Sabbath or abuse the name of God by vain oaths, and they are not troubled by it, because it is not against their own private interest. Number two, a pretender to the things of Christ will do service for church or state by halves, only going so far as it makes for his interest and no further. And this is the reason why the reformation of religion is but a patch reformation in most places of the Christian world, and as a cake half-baked, because states and kingdoms do not mold the reformation according to the word of God, but rather according to the interests of the state. And thus it was in Henry VIII's time, 
he thrust out the Pope's supremacy because it furthered his plans for a second marriage. But he continued much of the Popish religion and made six articles called, quote, a whip with six strings, close quote, that became the death of many godly men. Erasmus had a notable saying of Luther that he would have been a good man if he had not meddled too much with the monk's bellies and the Pope's triple crown. The Pope was willing to yield to reformation of the Church only in so far as it might be consistent with the upholding of his triple crown, and no further. Number three, when a pretender to the things of Christ has gotten what he aims at, he will leave Christ completely and lay aside all his pretenses, even as the angels who appeared to Abraham and Lot assumed bodies, not out of love to the bodies they assumed, but only to help them complete their errand. When they had done it, they laid them aside. And so, also, there are many who assume a profession of religion in order that they may pursue their ambitious designs. And once they have obtained them, they lay their profession aside, as a fisherman does his net. I have read of a pope who began his life as a fisherman, when he was an abbot, and then a bishop, and then a cardinal, he had his net spread for a tablecloth to remind of his humble and poor origins. But when he came to be made pope, he then commanded his servants to lay aside his net, for now he had caught what he had been so long in fishing for. Number four, he that seeks his own things under the pretense of seeking the things of Christ will walk contrary to his professions, declarations, vows, and covenants, even when he seems outwardly to be most solemn and serious in making them. Balaam did this. He professed that if he had a house full of gold given him, he would not do anything contrary to the will of God. And yet at the same time, he goes with the messenger sent by Balak. Numbers chapter 22, verses 15 through 21. Are there not many among us who, when they covenanted with hands lifted up to heaven to endeavor the extirpation of error, heresy, and whatsoever was contrary to sound doctrine, did they not, even at the very same time, secretly foment and countenance the things they covenanted against? Number five. Lastly, he that seeks his own interest while pretending to seek the things of Christ, this man does not care what ways and means are employed to accomplish his ends, nor by what kind of persons whether the ways are lawful or unlawful, the person's good or bad, it is all the same to him so long as he may obtain his ambitious intentions. And one more note about the present on this, all the politicians are doing it, all of them. Okay? This is a certain sign of a notorious hypocrite. For he that truly and sincerely endeavors to promote the glory and honor of Christ will never go out of Christ's way to obtain his desires. He knows that Christ will be more dishonored through his sin than honored by his endeavors, though they be ever so laborious and sincere. Let us, I beseech you, examine ourselves according to these several notes and marks and see whether we might be guilty of this sinful, cursed, and devilish self-seeking. And know that if this sin rules and reigns in us, it makes us accessory to a fourfold murder. It makes us self-murderers, church and state murderers, and Christ murderers. It brings us under a double gospel curse, for the apostle says, quote, If any man does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be 
anathema marantha, close quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. May the Lord give us hearts that seriously weigh these things. And now, to the use of exhortation. The second use is the use of exhortation, which is twofold. Number one, to beseech all here present, whether magistrates, ministers, or private citizens, to take heed of the sinful, self-seeking, and six-headed monster of seeking our own gain and credit apart from, before, or more than the things of Christ, or of seeking our own things under the pretense of seeking the things of Christ, or when they stand in competition with the things of Christ, of seeking the good of our vile bodies to the neglect of our precious and immortal souls. As Christ said of covetousness, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, so I say of this sin, take heed and beware of sinful self-seeking. Consider the exceeding greatness of this sin and the woeful and mischievous fruits and effects of it. This is the plague sore of church and state, the great caterpillar that devours all the green things of the land. It has destroyed our parliaments, ministries, and gentry. It is that which obstructs the glorious reformation we have expected and desired for so long. It is not self-seeking, but self-hating and self-destroying. He that seeks to give satisfaction to his corrupt self is just like a man who gives strong wine to the friend who has a high fever. It is not to love him, but rather to kill him. He that seeks to please his sinful self seeks to strengthen his disease, to maintain that within him which God hates, and to nourish that which will destroy his soul. As I have said before, he that seeks the welfare of his body while neglecting the welfare of his soul destroys both body and soul. This is just as if farmers in their time of harvest would gather in the stubble and leave the corn to be devoured by hogs. It is just as if a father took great care to feed and clothe his children, but not to instruct or teach them. In a word, he that seeks his own ease and safety, his own gain and credit, his own pleasure and satisfaction, yet neglects and slights the things of Christ, this man is the greatest self-hater and self-destroyer. For he that does not seek the interest of Christ shall never have any interest in Christ. Number two. To beseech you to labor for the divine, heavenly, and blessed self-seeking mentioned in the beginning of the sermon. Physicians, when they see men bleed immoderately at the nose, will let them bleed from another vein, so that they may make a diversion, and therefore stop the bleeding. Oh, that God would use me as his instrument today to make a most glorious and happy diversion that would turn you all from self-seekers to Christ-seekers. Oh, that I could prevail with you to seek the things of Jesus Christ before and more than your own things. Oh, how happy would London be if it could be said of it that all the magistrates, ministers, and private people seek the things of Christ more vigorously and cordially than they do their own things. To move you to this, consider, number one, what are the things which you so immoderately and inordinately seek after? Letter A, they are not your own in the proper sense, as you have heard. Letter B, they're not worth owning. They're vain and empty, empty of reality and soul satisfaction. They are vanishing and perishing like houses made of snow or wax. And not only so, but they are also vexing and tormenting, a 
according to what is said by one that had full and ample experience of them. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 2, 17 and 26. Number two, consider the excellency of the things of Jesus Christ, which you so much neglect and undervalue. The truths of Christ, the ordinances or laws, day, ministry, government of Christ, the preservation, propagation, and reformation of religion. These are glorious and excellent things in their own nature, and so far exceed your own things, which you so greatly labor after, that they are not worthy to be named along with the things of Christ of which we speak. I lack time to set out the transcendent glory and excellency of gospel concernments, the vanity, emptiness, and nothingness of all our own earthly enjoyments. Only let me desire you to take notice, letter A, that the Lord Jesus Christ sought not his own things. He left heaven for us, and shall we not neglect the world for him? Letter B, for what poor trifles do you despise the glorious things of the gospel? Letter C, if you do not Seek after the things of Christ more than your own, you're in a cursed condition, and it would have been better if you'd never been born. Letter D. The things of Jesus Christ shall prosper, though you do not seek the prosperity of them. What Mordecai said to Esther in another case, I would say to you, quote, Enlargement and deliverance shall arise to the people of God from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, close quote. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. A time shall come when, quote, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it, close quote. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. When the, quote, kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, close quote. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. When the little, quote, stone cuts out the mountain without hands, close quote, shall, quote, destroy all opposite kingdoms, close quote, and become a, quote, great mountain and fill the whole earth, close quote. When every, quote, nation and kingdom that will not serve the Lord Jesus shall perish and be utterly wasted, close quote. Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, and 44, verse 45, uh, 44 through 45. God has destroyed many nations and kingdoms because they neglected to set up the kingdom of Christ. And so also will he do to us if we follow their examples. If we prefer the building up of our own houses before the building of God's house, God will build up his own house by other instruments. But he will destroy us and our houses. Number three. Lastly, consider that the man who seeks most the things of Christ also seeks the most for himself. He that is the greatest Christ seeker is the greatest self seeker. For God has said, quote, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, close quote. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. When Solomon sought after wisdom, God gave him wealth and riches as a surplus. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 14. If we seek the things of Christ first and foremost, God will put our own things into the bargain even as paper and thread are added to a purchased commodity. Thus, I have put an end to the sermon of self-seeking. Oh, that I could put an end to the sin of self-seeking. Two things I dare affirm. Number one, that this sin has been the original cause of all England's miseries. And number two, that it will never be well with England nor shall we ever see better days until this sin is mortified.
Therefore, let us go to Christ and labor by faith to fetch power from his death, to crucify and mortify this sin. Let it be our daily prayer that England, and also the United States, may have more Christ-seekers and fewer self-seekers. In other words, that God would make us all true self-seekers by making us true Christ-seekers. That's the end of the sermon.